Okay, so I think I have this right. So everybody, welcome to Information Literacy, Critical Thinking and Practical Skills. I'm really glad that you all were able to join me today. Um, as I said a minute ago, we have everybody muted right now, but if you have a question, I do want you to unmute yourself and ask or use the chat feature to ask. Wendy's going to try to help me keep an eye on that um, because I want this to be um, addressing your questions and your concerns, but most of today is going to be kind of lecture from me. I have a lot of background information to share with you. And um, so there's going to be a lot of information today. In coming weeks, I'm hoping we'll have a little more time for some discussion too. I'll be assigning some readings um, and the, then that'll give you some basis for discussion, especially next week. So this is FE University. This program, um, as you guys know, is for older adults in the Iron County, Wisconsin area. We have no tests. We have no real assignments. There are no grades. So you keep up with the class as much as you like or as little as you like. So I have some extensive readings that I've put online for you and I'll talk about those later. If you don't get through them all, don't worry about it, don't panic. Um, not a big deal. You do what you can and what you're comfortable with. Some of the readings I linked and I marked as optional because they're a little dense, they're a little academic, um, they're a little difficult to read and stay awake through. So um, feel free to get through those if you can, but if you can't, that's not a problem. So let's see here. There. Okay, so week one, misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. Um, so I think we all know why we're here. 2016 Oxford Dictionary's word of the year was post-truth, right after the Brexit election and right after the, um, or during the time of the Brexit campaign and the 2016 U.S. presidential election. This was an important concept. In 2017, the following year, the Collins Dictionary named its word of the year as fake news. So yeah, we, it feels very much right now like fake news is taking over the world. And it's a real problem for all kinds of issues. So how prevalent is misinformation? Well, in the three months leading up to the United States presidential election in 2016, the top 20 fake election news stories, now only 20 stories we're talking about here, got 8.7 million engagements online. And the top 20 real election news stories only got 7.4 engagements. So you can see that fake news stories are spreading faster um, than real stories. And this has generally been true, uh, according to the research, across the board. Things that are not true spread more quickly. And that's because they tend to be inflammatory, they tend to incite um, people's emotions, and they tend to get people riled up and wanting to share these really important messages that they think just need to get out there. Um, so that's a problem. Top 156 misleading stories on Facebook during that election season got 38 million shares. Um, engagements are things like likes and shares and comments. Shares are people taking the time to actually boost a message by sharing it with their friends, by posting it again on their Facebook page. So that is a lot of misinformation, 38 million times for just 156 stories. And of course, we know there's a lot more than 156 fake news stories circulating on Facebook. So the amount of fake news out there, the amount of misleading information is pretty enormous. So this week, we're going to take an introduction, a introductory look at different kinds of misinformation, and I'll show you some examples of each. We're going to look at the consequences, uh, or at least some of the consequences of misinformation. And then most importantly, I think this week, in order to give us some context, we're going to talk about what professional journalism is and what's, what sets it aside or uh, sets it apart from fake news and from citizen journalism. Um, both of those things, um, while citizen journalism is an important feature of a free society and of a democracy. But there are clear differences between professional journalists and citizen journalists. And it's important to know those differences in order to make good judgments about what is and is not fake news or misinformation. Um, but before we start, I wanted to just set out some ground rules. As I said, today we're going to be talking, I'm going to be doing a lot of talking. We're not going to be doing a lot of discussion today. Um, but this is a hot button topic for a lot of people. And I am not here to push a political agenda. So I am your community's librarian, and it's my job to give you access to reliable information that helps you with your daily life. It is not my job to provide you um, with partisan opinions. Um, it's also really clear to anybody who doesn't have their head in a bag that um, misinformation occurs on all sides of the political spectrum. Um, oh, excuse me, I, I went ahead there, or went back, sorry. 
Um, so mis people are affected by misinformation and disinformation all the time, no matter what their political stripe. Um, that being said, in the next four weeks, you're probably going to see me share more resources that talk about the right wing use of misinformation than the left wing use of it. And there is a reason for that. And it's not just my personal political leaning. It is because in the 2016 presidential election and during the Brexit campaign, there was clear evidence that right wing actors were using misinformation and disinformation more actively than left wing actors. And because there was that evidence and because those events are relatively recent, this is what academia is studying right now. This is what um, researchers and psychologists are looking at to better understand these phenomena. So um, there just is a lot being written by academics right now about the right-wing use of misinformation. Now, I am gonna go out of my way to try to find you examples on all sides of the political spectrum. Um, and if you are aware of some credible and fact-checked examples that can demonstrate um, a balanced view on all these issues, I would love it if you'd share those with me as well. So um, that was kind of my disclaimer. Uh, I also want to say that it's sometimes difficult to talk about these topics without there being partisan issues or without people getting emotional. And so when we get into days when we have more discussion, I want to just remind us all that we have a, a few ground rules that I'd like us to follow. And these are pretty typical ground rules for any uh, productive discussion. I stole these from the uh, University of Michigan Center for Research on Learning and Teaching. Um, listen respectfully without interrupting people. Listen actively with an ear to understanding other people's views. Don't just be pretending to listen while you plan what you're going to say next. Actually listen to what your colleagues are saying. Criticize ideas, not the people behind them as much as possible, although context is important and we'll talk about that. Commit to learning and not debating. We're not having a debate class here. We're not actively trying to sway each other's opinions. We're trying to share ideas and information. Um, Avoid blame and speculation and infl inflammatory language. Allow everyone the chance to speak. Avoid assumptions about any member of the class or generalizations about social groups. And don't ask an individual to speak for their entire social group, whether that's perceived or their own assessment of the social group. Um, I will call out, I, I wanna have respectful discussion where differing views are tolerated. And I do wanna hear from all sides of, of these ideas. I will, however, call you out if you are making statements that disparage people based on race, religion, sex, gender, LGBTQ status, class, or ethnicity. Those kinds of statements go against the principles of the Mercer Library and I hope of many of you as individuals. And so we won't tolerate any sorts of hate here, um, but I don't anticipate that being a problem. This is a good group of people. Um, so misinformation and disinformation. You'll hear me using these terms. They are not synonymous. Um, so let's talk about what the difference is. So misinformation is kind of like playing the telephone game. Uh, things get taken out of context. They get taken out of time. They, they get subtly changed enough times to be untrue. Misinformation is any false information, but it's specifically information that was not created in order to mislead. It can often be just a mistake. I didn't know it wasn't true when I shared it. That's misinformation. It can often be true, it often be spread by well-meaning people. Someone who'll say, you know, it can't hurt for you to think about this. It can't hurt, or just in case, let me tell you this. Um, and like I said, sometimes it's just like playing the telephone game. So some examples of misinformation. Um, here's a wacky one. And this started circulating um, just after the coronavirus started becoming a serious issue. I think I first saw this in March. Um, this is a picture of something that was supposedly posted to a bulletin board, and it talks about how the coronavirus, the pH of the coronavirus is between 5.5 and 8.5, and all we should do is eat alkaline foods and we'll protect ourselves. There's a number of wacky things about this. Um, first of all, the pH scale only goes to 14, so how could dandelions have a pH of 22.7? It's literally off the chart. Um, but then also, uh, it, there's just, you know, for example, it's talking about lemon being an alkaline food, when we all pretty much know that lemon is acidic. So there's no basis in truth of this, of this ridiculous posting. Um, but this spread on the internet quite a bit. Why? Well, we don't really know. Why did someone create it in the first place? Were they really just making stuff up just to be a problem? Were they um, trying to promote the use of avocado and garlic? Were they a member of the garlic uh, lobby or something? We don't really know. 
But the people who shared it, most of the people that I saw sharing it online were doing it and they were saying, it can't hurt. Lemon juice is a health food. Drink some more of it. Put some garlic in, you, in your food. We know it has antioxidants. Um, so is this a problem? Well, yeah, it is. It's a problem in, in a number of ways. First of all, it discourages people from thinking critically. Anyone who knows anything about science knows that this is ridiculous. Um, but if you accept this at face value, it's just another step towards just accepting what you see without questioning it. It also can give people a false sense of security. I ate dinner with a ton of garlic last night. I don't need to wear a mask to protect myself from COVID. So, um, so this, is an, uh, this is an example of misinformation in that we don't really think it was created to promote a specific agenda, but it's clearly false. So here's another one that you'll see a lot on Facebook. Um, these are those, these Facebook privacy statements. I hereby state that I do not give Facebook permission to use my images, et cetera, et cetera. And people will say things like this one, better safe than sorry, or just in case, or you never know, I better cover all my bases. Um, not true. You cannot exclude yourself from Facebook's user term, terms of service by making a statement like this. So why is this a problem? Well, again, it discourages you from thinking critically about issues. It encourages a misunderstanding of how terms of agreement or user terms work in online services. And those are becoming more and more important as privacy is an issue for all of us. Um, and, you know, so we don't really know why people post these things. Usually it's because of a misunderstanding of an issue. For example, these always tend to circulate when Facebook does change its terms of service. You'll get a notice from Facebook saying your ter the terms are changing, please read and agree to them. And people say, oh my gosh, I got to deal with this. So they share this misinformation. Um, so here's another example. You'll see a lot online of people sharing flyers of missing children. People are doing this because they want to be helpful. They're concerned about missing children. They want to do something if they can. And it's, it's coming from a good motivation. But the problem is that usually these things are extremely problematic. There are occasions when these missing child warnings are legitimate and it would be helpful to share them, but it's much more frequently the case that it, they're just not useful. They're out of date. The child has already been found for good or bad. Um, sometimes it's with children who are trying to escape abusive or dangerous situations and someone will put up a post like this pretending to be their mother or their aunt or their whoever, when in fact the child is trying to escape an abuser. Um, and oftentimes um, it leads to an incorrect perception that the world is a less safe place. When you go on Facebook and you see five missing child warnings today, your brain is triggered to think, oh my gosh, there's a crisis. Why are all these children going missing? The world is scary. I need to act defensively all the time. When in fact, crime statistics show us the exact opposite. The world is a safer place than it was in decades past. Um, so again, this is coming from a good motivation, people who wanna help, but it's not helpful at all. So let's talk about disinformation. Um, disinformation is really defined by its intent. Why was it created? If it was created specifically to mislead people in order to achieve a goal, it's disinformation. Um, now, sometimes disinformation is spread by people who don't have a, a bad goal in mind. They pick something up like the bad, like the missing child warning and they share it because they want to be helpful. But um, disinformation is specifically created in order to deceive, in order to achieve a goal. What kinds of outcomes can be affected by disinformation? Well, you know, clearly voting choices are affected by information and disinformation. Um, health choices, like whether or not to get a vaccine, whether or not to wear a mask when you're dealing with COVID-19, um, those kinds of choices. Consumer choices, what you are willing to pay for, whether or not you're likely to fall for a scam. Um, and then just generally, like with the missing children flyer again, it just sort of changes your perception of the world. And when you live in a state of fear, you are easier to manipulate. So we'll see a lot of disinformation around climate change and vaccination and conspiracy theories of all kinds, boogeymen that are out to get you or get your money. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are legitimate warnings about those things, but a lot of times you're gonna see disinformation campaigns around those issues specifically because they help manipulate you. Um, and so the most powerful disinformation has facts mixed in with it. 
because it's easier to believe and harder to debunk. So that kernel of truth in a conspiracy theory is what makes people believe in it. That kernel of truth that yes, children do go missing is what makes people motivated to perpetuate an issue. And so subtle disinformation campaigns can often be more useful than blatantly false misinformation campaigns, which is why when I showed you that pH scale relating to putting lemon juice as an alkaline food, I put that in misinformation, not disinformation, because it's not believable enough for most thinking people to, to really take any action. And also it had no goal. It had no measurable goal to try to change your behavior in a way that benefits the person who created it. People who create misinformation around voting issues, for example, they have clear financial and political motives. They wanna get someone elected. And so if they can change your thinking around a candidate or around an issue, that is the, the goal of their misinformation or their disinformation. Um, so let's look at some examples of, of clear disinformation campaigns. Um, the first one here is, I think, uh, uh, one of the scarier ones out there right now, and that's QAnon. You will see this Q symbol. This one is a sticker that you can actually purchase on Amazon right now. Um, you'll see the Q symbol in lots of contexts. QAnon is a dangerous conspiracy theory. And I, and I say that um, not as a personal opinion, but as a, um, a, an opinion I've heard from respected people online in the, in the law enforcement community. And, and QAnon believes that uh, a ring of Satan worshiping pedophiles is running a global sex trafficking ring and plotting against President Trump. Um, so if you've heard of Pizzagate, this is like Pizzagate on steroids. There have been incidents of domestic terrorism, kidnappings, targeting of people, um, and even the murder of a Gambino crime family member related to QAnon conspiracy theories. Why are these conspiracy theories created? Mostly it's to confuse people and to support and to bolster support for President Trump by promoting the need for a law and order candidate. Um, this, this idea that the world is a dangerous place and you have to have someone who's tough on crime, basically. Another dangerous, I, I hope short-lived conspiracy theory was Plandemic. Pandemic was a very slickly produced documentary video. I use that term with air quotes around it, um, promoting false information about the COVID-19 pandemic. It was heavily criticized by medical professionals across the world. It was removed from online platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, all of the platforms that could find it would take it off of their platform because it spread dangerous misinformation. Um, why was it created? Most likely it was created to create uh, to generate fame and income for its creators. Um, these people had a political and a financial interest in promoting conspiracy theories because then they would boost their own personal credibility. If people believed them, they would get hired for speaking engagements, et cetera, et cetera. This one was shared in my social media feed by somebody that I personally know who shared it and said, and I quote, I wrote this down because it struck me at the time, I don't know if it's true, but it resonates with my beliefs. And that's often how misinformation and disinformation gets spread. I don't know if it's true, but I think you should think about it. And we'll talk later about how repetition increases your belief in something, whether you recognize it intellectually as true or not. The fact that you see it multiple times will change your perception of it. And so that's why sharing this kind of thing is dangerous. It's not a matter of starting the conversation or just in case, or I just want to throw this out there for you to consider. It really is significantly affecting people's perception of information. So uh, one of the most uh, newsworthy examples of disinformation campaigns right now is the Internet Research Agency. This is a um, Russian troll farm. We'll, I'll explain that term a little bit more next week. But it is a, um, a, a Russian-supported business that pays people to be on social media, create fake accounts, and make comments and posts and share information online. Um, the Internet Research Agency significantly affected the 2016 pre presidential election and Brexit and elections in other places around the world. The United States is not alone in being subject to disinformation campaigns. Um, on February 16th, 2018, Robert Mueller indicted 13 Russian individuals and three Russian organizations for engaging with op in, in operations to interfere with U.S. political election process, including the presidential election. 
Um, so this is uh, a legitimate concern. This is a, um, a known phenomenon, a measured phenomenon, and people who have been uh, criminally indicted on these issues. So we're going to talk again a little bit more next week about what troll farms are and what bots are and how they manipulate information online. But um, this is, again, just a concerted disinformation campaign. So um, sometimes it's not clear, is something disinformation or misinformation? The difference is the intent. Was it created in order to, receive, to deceive or to promote a political agenda? And sometimes it's really hard to know. So this is a chart that was actually shared by the Georgia Department of Health. It was talking about the top five counties with the greatest number of confirmed COVID cases. And from looking at this graph, it appears that Georgia was getting its COVID cases under control. The numbers were going down until you look carefully and you look at the date line at the bottom of that graph. And if you can see that, it's hard. I couldn't find a clear image of it because Georgia has obviously scrubbed it from their health department websites. Um, the, the graph reads April 28, April 27, April 29, May 1, April 30, uh, May 4, May 6, May 5, May 2. The dates are out of order. And then if you look at each grouping within the dates, the, each different color bar represents a county. And if you look at each one of those little groupings, the counties are reordered within them. So this graph is showing you absolutely nothing, but it came from the Georgia Department of Health. Was it created to deceive? Was it created to give the illusion that COVID cases were coming down in Georgia and therefore they should start reopening their state? We don't know. Uh, a, a spokesperson for the governor tweeted that the uh, x-axis was set up that way to show descending values to more easily demonstrate peak values in counties on those dates. We apologize, it is fixed. I find that hard to believe. I don't think there's any thinking person that would look at that graph and say that this is a useful way to display the data. However, I find it a lot easier to believe as a user of Excel myself that somebody just messed up creating the graph. Sometimes when you're generating a graph out of a large amount of data, the system does things in a wacky way all by itself. And if you're not paying attention, um, you, can, you, can, you can share that out, right? So the question is, was this disinformation designed to, dis to mislead those who are making decisions about COVID in Georgia? Or was this just plain incompetence? We don't really know. I'm sure we all have opinions about what might be more likely and, or less likely. Um, but, you know, it's hard to know sometimes. So this is one of those examples of a blurred line. We don't really know. Is this misinformation or disinformation? Um, so I'm going to take a pause here for just a second. And I've been talking for like 20 minutes already. Does anyone have any questions or comments to share? Yes, um, about the pandemic thing. I think I talked to you about it, Teresa, when it first, when I first got a message, it was a personal text message from somebody that I don't, I, I know through a, because we, we, we both collect decoys, but I didn't know anything about his political leanings or anything. And it was just like you said, he sent this personal message saying something like, I don't know if this is true, but it scares me or something like that, please take a look. Let me know what you think. And anyway, it, it, I, was, I was not immediately, but I got really suspicious because it was so out of character for this person to be sending me a message like that. And that's when I called mm -hmm. you. What is this? And you knew all about it, so. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll see that um, people who follow certain, um, certain organizations, they will be directly encouraged. Text this to your friends, email this to your friends, share this with your friends. They'll be, you know, encouraged to directly make those personal contacts to share some of this stuff. Um, and again, the motivations behind it sometimes aren't clear. So this guy is, is a, you know, sort of distant acquaintance of yours. You know, does, was he, does he personally have a stake in the message of pandemic? Probably not, but he is part of some organization that was encouraging him to do that, I would think. I have a question. Yeah. What about, what about all those, um, you know, when you're on Facebook and you read something and then you click on the corner and you report it mm -hmm. and it gives you all kinds of options to categorize it? 
Yes. Um, and you try to pick one that it's going to fit into. And I often can't find an appropriate category. I just know it's disinformation. Yeah. Um, what do they do with that? Or <laughs> what good is that? Um, so the only thing that you're doing, those are, it's not a bad idea to report things that you know that are disinformation. Um, for many reasons, first of all, it will put it on Facebook's radar. It will also reduce your likelihood of seeing that kind of stuff in your Facebook feed. But when you report something in Facebook, it's only being reported to Facebook. So um, Facebook really is only going to look at it within the lens of their own terms of service. Does it violate their stated terms of service? If it does, they may remove it or they may mark it. Nowadays, you'll see Facebook and Twitter and some other places um, fact checking things. They'll mark things as likely misinformation. That's not always helpful. I'll talk about that actually in a future week. Um, but so when you're reporting something like that, you're really only reporting it to Facebook. Can that reduce the amount of spread of something like that? Yeah, if it's egregious enough that it violates Facebook's terms of service, it can. Um, but it doesn't really affect it in, a, in the wider world. Um, but it can get it removed specifically from Facebook or from the place that you specifically saw it from. And you're right, often the, the categories that they give you to choose from are not, they don't cover just plain old, this is not true. Um, they often only include things like hate speech or harassment or scam or things like that. Well, and then I, I noticed that a person who had been posting a lot of that stuff um, was actually blocked mm -hmm. for a while. Yep. That, that can happen if enough people are reporting someone's content to Facebook. Facebook can put them in what people jokingly call Facebook jail, where they'll, be, they'll have their account deactivated for a period of time, or they can have their account permanently deactivated if they keep violating Facebook's terms of service. Um, they can always go back and create a new account with a different email address, and email addresses are free, so that's... Um, not a real huge problem other than they will have lost all the context they made in their old account. So, but yes, it can result in people having their accounts um, either temporarily or permanently blocked by the, by the company. And it was political. Mm -hmm. okay. Teresa. Yeah. Um, I don't have a question, but I just have a comment about, these media th sites, it would be very interesting if someone would develop uh, something that would show just how fast this information can go. Can be yeah. spread. Yeah, you'll see some of that. Um, well, some of the studies that I've been reading try to do that to some certain extent, which is where some of those statistics came from this morning that I shared with you. Um, and you'll see people, it used to be a more common thing where you'd see um, this is my teacher's project. She wants to show you how fast this message can get around and please share. Um, and again, those are sometimes misinformation. Sometimes they're not really teacher projects. But um, yeah, there have been people who've tried to, to pin that down. It's a difficult thing to track because of the nature of social media where you only ha have access to the connections that you've been approved to have. So it makes it a little bit of a challenge for researchers to determine exactly how fast things spread. Um, but there are people who are trying to do it. It's just hard to narrow down. Don't you think Facebook can do that? They can see? Oh, yeah, probably. But Facebook is not motivated to discourage people from sharing things. Facebook's business model is to keep you engaged and to keep you sharing things. And um, they don't honestly care if you're sharing things that are false, if it's generating ad views for them. So they, they have a strictly profit motive. Um, even Google, which used to have the company-wide motive of don't be evil, they've dropped that motto, that motto now. Um, they, they, don't, they don't try to even say that they're not going to be evil anymore. Um, and I'm, I don't mean to use an inflammatory word like evil, but that literally was Google's motto was don't be evil. That was their whole business, their whole uh, mission statement at one point. It is no longer. Okay, so let's get back to my presentation a little bit here. Um, so let's talk about fake news. This is, a, this is a specific term in the eyes of researchers. It's not fake news just because you don't agree with it. So we know that people use that term incorrectly. Um, if they don't like something, they'll yell fake news and, and move on. But there is an actual um, description and definition of what fake news is. 
And a lot of times, well, one of the biggest trends we're seeing right now is fake local news sites. These are sites that are completely false. They are made up, usually by a company or an individual, but often by a company. And their entire mission is to share false information and disinformation. Um, they're also known by some people as pink slime sites. Um, that name comes from the uh, meat substitute that fills chicken nuggets. Um, so it's, it's sort of like meat, but it's not really what most people would think of as meat. Pink slime sites or fake news sites um, look like news, but they're not news. Um, they're related to content farms. Content farm is a specific term that is defined as a site that focuses on language that's optimized for search engines in order to generate clicks and views. Um, content farms don't care if something is true, first of all, and they, and they also don't care if something is well written. They just want it to be uh, a clickbaity enough headline for people to click on it and therefore to serve up ad views. Um, so, but pink slime sites, on the other hand, um, or fake news sites, they are intentionally sharing disinformation in order to cloud issues. So they do have articles that appear to be reasonably well written um, and appear to be sharing information, but in fact, they are not. So um, what are clues to identifying a fake news site? Well, you'll see very few or no bylines on stories. Legitimate websites always share, news sites always share a byline for the author of the article. And they will also allow you usually to click on that byline and see more information about that report. You're not going to see that on uh, fake news sites. You're going to see articles that appear word for word on a number of these sites. So um, a lot of these sites are automatically generated and they are generated in uh, multiples all at once. Last fall, 40 of them suddenly appeared in Michigan alone. And all of these sites are pretty much sharing the same stories. They're sharing the same types of content with only minor variations and they're literally sharing stories word for word. Um, when you're looking at these sites, one of the best ways to evaluate the, the um, quality of a website is to find its about us page. And you're not gonna find that on fake local news sites. Or if you do find it, it's gonna be vague. It's gonna be um, nondescript. It's not gonna give you a lot of detail. And these sites are typically not part of a local broadcast media or they're not part of a local print newspaper. Now there are legitimate news sites that are online only. So that's not a, a hard and fast rule. But if something looks like it might be a television news site or a newspaper site, but you can't see that there's actually a newspaper or a television station attached to it, that's a red flag. Um, so you can use these kinds of visual clues to examine a site's reliability, but if you're not local to an area, it's really hard to tell. Um, the answer is pretty much don't trust a local news site unless you actually know it in real life. That's not a great answer, but it's kind of the only answer I have to offer right now. So let me look, show you an example. Um, here are a couple of the, I mentioned that a, a bunch of these appeared last fall in Michigan all of a sudden. Here are two separate websites, um, Ann Arbor Times and Detroit City Wire. Neither of these organizations exist in real life. These were created by a company that suddenly created all of these local news sites all over the country, but Michigan for some reason was a hotspot for these. And you can see from their layouts, they look very similar. They, um, at the time I looked at these last night, they didn't really have the exact same articles, but there were a lot of similarities and there were a lot of um, similar articles hidden in these different sections. So um, this one does happen to have a byline on a couple of things, but a lot of them just don't have bylines or those bylines will be fake people too. So it's really hard to tell. So if your source for something is what looks like a local news site, double check that, triple check it, quadruple check it, because there's a good chance that it's not legitimate. Um, again, the highlight of a really good disinformation campaign is to take a kernel of truth and elaborate it. So you are gonna find some of these articles that seem kind of true or may be true, but they are providing context for other things that are not true. Another thing that I like to talk about when I talk about um, the veracity of websites and other media is satire because a lot of people fall for it. Um, they say, don't eat the onion. The onion is, is one of the better known satire websites out there. Um, and satire is important. It's, it's an important part of culture. It's legally protected speech. It's an effective way to provide social commentary. Um, but it's problematic when people take it seriously. And sometimes people do and they share a satire article not realizing that it was written to be satire. 
So popular satire website sites include The Onion. Um, that one was started in here in Wisconsin, I think as associated with the University of Wisconsin. It's since moved to Chicago. The Beaverton, the Babylon Bee, Clickhole, Topeka News, there are tons of these. Um, and then of course there's just plain old humor online, which can be misinterpreted by later viewers. Because these things have such a long sharing tale, they, they circulate for a long time, it's hard to know the original context. So it's getting harder and harder to tell what's satire and what's not. I mean, there was a legitimate news story just this week that someone found a brain or what looks like a brain wrapped in tinfoil on the shore of Lake Michigan. That's real. Is it a satire site? If you saw something like that without knowing the context behind it, would you assume that it was real? I wouldn't. I would assume it was a joke, but it's getting harder and harder to tell. The weird world is a weird place right now. Um, and so people have a tendency to have this sort of knee-jerk reaction and, and just share something without really stopping to look at the source. Um, and because we're just primed right now to believe wild and wacky things because so many wild and wacky things are happening, it's becoming kind of a problem. So here's some examples of some satire. The first one there is a Sasquatch alert that appeared as a joke, as a humor piece on a geocaching website that I saw. Um, but of course, somebody took the time to slap a Forest Service logo on there and a Wisconsin DNR logo on there. So if you saw this later and you weren't thinking, could you potentially believe that it was real? I think, you know, you could imagine that happening. Um, the next one is a screenshot from The Onion, democratic process in peril as billions of Americans chase after mail-in ballots caught in the wind. Um, there have been a lot of problems with mail-in ballots right now. There's been a lot of controversy around mail-in mail -in voting, uh, a lot of issues surrounding absentee ballots. So The Onion is very, very good at taking current issues and writing them as satire in order to do social commentary. Um, but people all the time make the mistake of copying something like this and sharing it out to their friends without realizing that it was meant to be satire, that it was meant to be a commentary and not a true story. Um, and then, of course, another big problem, a big um, issue for information literacy is scams. These are, you know, very familiar to a lot of us, but they are essentially information literacy problems. Do you have the skills that you need? to investigate claims, or are you gonna be swayed by emotion or fear and make yourself more susceptible to scams? Um, there's no sign that scammers are slowing down. Um, the overall US fraud losses of $1.9 billion in 2019, according to the AARP. Imposter scams are continuing to grow. So this is where someone um, pretends to be someone that they're not, whether they're pretending to be an official agency like the Social Security Administration or the IRS or whether they're pretending to be someone who's falling in love with you online, or they're pretending to be a tech support person who's identified that you have a virus or that you've been watching child pornography or that something else scary is happening with your computer. Um, and these cost people money. And I know people personally who have lost money to these kinds of scams. Median loss reported is about $700. Um, so that's median. There are people who lose less, but there are people who lose a lot more. Uh, romance scams in particular, when they go on for long periods of time, people are able to bilk a lot of money from their targets. Um, so people, young people, more often report falling prey to scams, which is interesting. We think of young people as um, more jaded, more technologically savvy, but that's not really true at all. Um, people ages 50 and older report losing higher amounts of money, and that's kind of to be expected because people ages 50 and older generally have more money than someone who's 20. Um, so scams can arrive by phone. We've all probably gotten the phone calls about your car warranty expiring or your business is not verified on Google or your social security card has been compromised in Georgia and you need to call them back right away to fix the problem. Um, these these proliferate, proliferate by email all the time. You get on an email list and you will get dozens of these a day. Um, there are websites that are promoting these fake scams that people can pray for fall prey to, and you can receive these things in the mail. Um, so I saw a, an example recently of what, what looked like a car recall notice postcard that had been smudged in the mail, but you could just read enough of it to make it sound like something scary was happening with your car and please call this phone number. And when you call the phone number, it was actually uh, one of those car warranty schemes. So um, the real world is not immune to these kinds of things. You will get this stuff in your mailbox. Um, 
one way to sort of, well, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, just be aware that people will try to scam you out of money and they'll ask for wire transfers, which should be a red flag in the first place. You would never wire money to somebody you don't know. Um, but they'll also ask for credit card numbers or they'll ask you to buy a prepaid credit card at the store and drop it in the mail or a gift card. Or they'll ask for your bank account information to verify something or other and then, the, then you know, they'll clean out your account. Um, checks, money orders, cash, they don't care how you're get, they're getting the money. They'll try anything that they think will work. So um, you have to always remember that if it seems too good to be true or if it seems too scary to be true, it probably isn't. It's probably a scam. Um, but unfortunately, scammers are good at what they do. If they weren't, they wouldn't keep doing it because it wouldn't pay off. And it does pay off. It's big business. Makes you wonder how people can sleep at night, but it is, in fact, big business. So I'm going to pause again here and ask if there's any questions or comments. Okay, not hearing any. I have one. Oh, I, sure, I, go ahead, Jen. I lost a computer due to a scam. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of took over my computer and I was between things and half paying attention to what was going on. So I was going through it. But anyway, they just got into my computer and then I realized this isn't a good thing and I shut it down and mm -hmm. took the computer in to be fixed because it was not functioning. I couldn't even open it. I couldn't even boot it up. Yeah. And he couldn't either. The mm. tech person. Yeah. So I lost everything on that computer. Yeah. Photos. Those tech support scams are the one that I have seen most often with people that I personally know. They are convincing. Um, and they, they, can actually take over your computer or make, give you the illusion that they've taken over your computer even when they haven't. And that's one of the ways they get in is that um, you think there's no other way to solve the problem other than to deal with these people. And um, it's usually not true. So yeah, they're, they're very, they can be very convincing. And I've known at least, I want to say three or four people. Well, four, if I count you now, Jan, uh, well, I might've known about yours before, but anyway, I know I've known at least three or four people in the local area that have been, victims of these tech support schemes. Um, they are big business right now. And, and it's usually a few hundred dollars or $400 at first, and then they need a little more money to fix something else. And then, you know, um, there have been businesses in the area who have had their computers taken over by scammers and they, they feel like there's not anything they can do about it. They have to um, get their business data back, right? So another reason to have good backups of all your systems. Do these people ever get caught? Rarely, rarely, rarely. Once in a while they will, but most of the time they're not acting from the United States, so that complicates things. Um, so I have, I, I can't think of any successful prosecution stories to tell you right now. I know it's happened, but um, it's not very common to get caught. Okay, so let's look at some of the consequences of misinformation. So you can say, so what, right? I mean, I'm smart, I might not fall for this. And we just heard an example of why, no, you're not smart enough. People who are very smart people can fall prey to misinformation and disinformation. Um, and even if you don't fall for it, you know that others can, and you know that those others can have a real world effect on you. So for example, um, a study was just published in the Public Library of Science last month that demonstrated in an academic way, probably not a super realistic way, but in an academic enough way that people are taking notice, that small changes to consumer behavior could result in citywide blackouts. If you can convince enough people that energy is available at a sale price during a certain time of the day, and people use that sale price to charge their electric cars or um, do other things that use a lot of power, you can actually cause a citywide brownout or blackout. Um, so this has not actually happened, but the, the researchers who did this study made a pretty convincing case that a subtle change of consumer behavior can have some pretty serious real world effects, on, especially on fragile ecosystem or fragile systems. So we know that our power grid is pretty fragile in many places in the country. 
it's already operating at maximum capacity without enough redundancy. And um, so a little tipping point, such as a hot day where everyone runs their air conditioner, is often already enough to push us into brownouts and blackouts. So um, just another example of how changing behavior doesn't have to be a huge change of behavior. A subtle difference um, can really have real world consequences. Um, and we can see crazy responses to current issues. So I mentioned before Pizzagate. Pizzagate, if you haven't heard of it, was um, a conspiracy theory that a certain pizza restaurant was running a child pedophile um, or child sex trafficking ring in its basement. And someone who believed that conspiracy theory went and to the pizza restaurant in question with an automatic weapon and fired it inside the building with the intent of drawing law enforcement there to investigate these crimes that of course didn't exist. There wasn't even actually a basement in this pizza restaurant. Um, this is another example. Uh, I put up a, a picture of a cell phone tower here because there is a current conspiracy theory that 5G cell phone towers can either um, weaken your immune system, thereby making you more susceptible to the COVID-19 virus, or in some crazy scenario, the 5G radiation actually manufactures the virus itself. Um, that makes no sense from any kind of thinking person's perspective. And if you have any understanding of the human immune system or of the extensive research that's been done about cell phone radiation, I, I can't say with 100% certainty that cell phone radiation is 100% um, harmless. And that's because scientists can never say something with 100% certainty, but there's been a lot of research. Um, but this has resulted in people actually tearing down and burning down cell phone towers around the world, particularly in the UK, um, because they believe that these 5G towers are causing the health problems that we are calling COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> this sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory on the fringe of society, but um, celebrities like Woody Harrelson, if you remember Woody from Cheers and Zombieland, he spread this rumor and um, helped it gain traction on the internet. So again, this is, you know, people with some influence start sharing these things and they can travel very, very quickly. So those are kind of wacky conspiracy theory examples, but there are realistic examples and less obvious and probably therefore more insidious examples and con of consequences of disinformation. Um, so the first one and obvious one is influence consumers and decision makers. So when you're making um, decisions about medical and financial choices, or if you're um, falling victim to a scam and you don't have the information literacy skills you need to evaluate those claims, that can be a serious problem. The um, so-called debates about vaccine safety have led to significantly lower vaccination rates in some countries, including ours, which have led to more cases of vaccine preventable diseases. Um, so these again have serious real world consequences. Influenced elections and political processes are the um, one that's on our minds right now. So PEN America, which is an organization that focuses on information and, and elections, um, notes that for this November election, they, they predict increased disinformation on voting time and place. So people sharing disinformation, saying that um, in one that's already gone around, Republicans vote on one day and Democrats vote on another day. Um, <clears throat> intimidation of election workers. We've actually seen this where um, clerks and, and other election workers are being intimidated. Um, people are saying that they should, that we should be sending law enforcement to observe voting places, things like that. Um, generating fake buzz around boycott the vote movements with the idea that, um, and these are particularly targeting young voters, uh, telling these voters that they don't have any good choices, that their voting doesn't matter, and that they should make a statement by refusing to vote. And obviously suppressing the vote may or may not support any one candidate, um, but you know, people who are promoting these ideas clearly think that suppressing votes will help their own candidates. Um, and so these are what appear to be grassroots movements, but they're really not. They're being generated by um, unscrupulous marketing companies, essentially. And then the usual disinformation about opposing candidates, which we're used to by now, right? Candidates lie about each other. Candidates exaggerate claims about each other. Um, we have this sort of jaded perception now that that's just what happens and it's fine. It's really not fine, um, but at any rate. Uh, and, and basically the, the consequence is profit for those who engage in these techniques. Profit financially, profit politically, profit personally. 
And that just encourages them to do it again. So where do we see disinformation? We talked already a lot today about online disinformation, um, but it doesn't just live online. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about online information throughout this class because it is um, a one way that the misinformation and disinformation spreads quickly, but it happens in all kinds of places. And it has a long history of appearing in all kinds of places. We know that there's been influence over the media basically since media was created. We'll talk a little bit more about that in future weeks, but um, you know, radio, obviously, this is Rush Limbaugh. There's radio, talk radio especially, is a big source of disinformation and misinformation. Television, I don't know if you recognize this guy, this is Jack Van Impey Presents and his wife, Roxella. And they appear generally late night on local TV stations. Jack has passed away now, I just learned that when I was researching this. But um, they would read headlines in a breathless and scary voice and talk about the rapture and Bible prophecies and, and generating disinformation and misinformation in order to get people to donate to their church. Uh, this is an example of a campaign mailer that you will see in your mailbox. I'm sure you probably already have seen examples. I know I have in my mailbox of campaign mailers that make misleading claims uh, in one direction or another. I've seen both already in my mailbox. <clears throat> this, uh, you will see misinformation and disinformation in print in partisan newspapers, in newsletters from partisan organizations. This is an example of a print newsletter from um, someone who had a lot of conspiracy theories about JFK's assassinations. This is an older example. These are selling for a lot of money online if you have one. And then um, push polling is another source of a lot of disinformation. You'll get a phone call that claims it's just a voter poll, but it's actually a push poll. It's trying to influence your thinking about an issue based on the way the question is worded. So, Here's an example that says, do you support a federal ban on conversion therapy for gay youth? The answer, the options are yes, conversion theory is barbaric, or no, it should be legal to abuse kids. Well, those aren't legitimate choices for that poll, right? Um, this is a poll that was designed to influence your thinking and influence your opinions. So my point here is that disinformation is not solely the realm of the internet. You need to have your radar up for this at all times, really. So I'm, I'm running along on time here, which doesn't surprise me because there was so much to talk about and I, um, I really have trouble narrowing it down because there's so much interesting things to say. But I, I do, we're, we're pretty much kind of done for the day talking about disinformation and misinformation, but I wanted to pause again and see if there's any questions or comments or if anybody has any examples they can throw out of something they've seen recently, um, not, in, not in the online world, but maybe in the real world. I'm going to have to leave. Is there a way of seeing the rest of this um, presentation? Um, yes, Macy, I'm recording this and I'm hoping to make it available through our website later. So I will send an email out to the whole group letting you know where you can find that when it's available. Thank you. Uh, I just have a comment um, about how Facebook um, handles um, complaints. Um, First of all, you have to realize that there's about 1.9 billion people per day make a comment on Facebook. And so there are, if you, if you send in a complaint, um, these complaints are handled by real people. There are approximately 10,000 real people around the world that handle these complaints and they have a lot to handle. And um, when, when they look at it, they have to, first of all, determine whether uh, what you're complaining about violates what they call their community standards. And the community standards are universal, so that something that violates a community standard, for example, in Saudi Arabia, might not violate it here. Um, so that's one thing. And then the next thing they have to look at is at the post to see if it's in context. Is it, is it sarcasm? Is it, you're, you're just saying that, oh, this is a terrible thing somebody said, or whatever. And so uh, don't be discouraged if you report something and nothing happens right away because, uh, the, you know, divide 1.9 billion uh, by 10,000 and you've got the possibility of handling a lot of, uh, a lot of issues on any given day. Yeah, thanks for that, Dick. That's a very good point. You have to real, real, realize the scale of these organizations. 
Um, yeah, Facebook is enormous, has a huge number of users, and so does Twitter, and so do all the other online yeah. platforms. Um, so there are huge personnel and technological challenges in dealing with this stuff. Okay, so let's go on to, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. So what's the deal with TikTok? <laughs> yeah, TikTok, I'm going to hold off on answering that question. I, I will try to answer that question. Um, I am not a TikTok user, and I don't know enough about it at this point to answer the, even the question, what's the deal with TikTok? Um, because there is a political deal. There are some legitimate security concerns, but then there are also some trumped up political charges about it. So um, I'm going to defer that question to a future week, but I have made a note about it and I'll get back to it. How does that sound? Okay. I'm not <laughs> sure I really want to know anyway. Probably not, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to talk for a few minutes about what professional journalism is. If we, need, if we want to recognize what fake news is, we have to understand how to recognize the real stuff too. Um, and so remember that fake news is not just fake because you don't like it. It's, it is a term that is specifically used, at least by information professionals, to mean news that is fabricated. Um, so what makes professional journalism different? Um, so first, let's talk about citizen journalism. Citizen journalism is really an important context, particularly in um, a democratic society or a society that um, prides itself on free speech. Um, citizen journalists disseminate information to the general public, usually by means of the internet, but sometimes in different ways. It often combines citizen journalism and user-generated content. So, um, you know, tweets on the ground, if you will, from someone who's at a protest or at an event, combined with someone who's writing about it later. Um, it can be an important way of disseminating useful information because great citizen journalism comes from that real time on the ground reporting. Sometimes it's on social media like Twitter and WhatsApp. Sometimes it's a Facebook live video that you're taking while, for example, a traffic stop is happening. Um, sometimes it's reporting from a major world event like the Arab Spring. So there are real benefits to having these information tools in the hands of the average person. Eyewitness accounts take on a lot more credibility when they're accompanied by video or they're accompanied by real-time tweets from an event. So we can get a good picture of something that's going on. And, and in many places, um, you know, where media is more controlled by the government or where there is more suppression of information or censoring of internet networks, um, citizen journalism can be an important tool to really understanding what's going on. The problem is that citizen journalists have very little accountability. It's pretty rare that someone does something so egregious as a citizen journalist to lose their job because their job is probably like, you know, they're a teacher or they're a doctor or they're a something. Um, it can have a problem, it cause them problems in their real life. And we have some examples from this year where people lost their jobs because of behavior that they reported online or that others reported about them online. Um, but for the most part, citizen journalists have no accountability. If I send out a fake tweet, no one's going to come knocking on my door and throw me in jail. Um, citizen journalists also tend to be very opinionated. They have a message that they want to share. They have a worldview that they want to promote. And they use their tweets or their reporting on, on the ground to promote those ideas. And the other thing is that anyone can start a blog or a website. And they don't have to tell you why they started it. They don't have to say, I hate this candidate and therefore I'm going to start what looks like a neutral news website, but there I'm going to actually just talk about how many bad choices that candidate has made this year. <clears throat> um, there's really no accountability there. Um, there are websites that use citizen journalists. Sometimes they'll call them guest bloggers. They'll call them guest contributors. Sometimes they're even the primary sources of their content. So HuffPost bloggers, Forbes contributors, these are, um, these are not paid journalists that are actually employees of Forbes, for example. They're guest writers. Um, this kind of guest writing is sometimes a way for people who want to be professional writers to sort of break into the industry. But it's also, a lot of times, a marketing tool. So there are companies that focus on search engine optimization, SEO, which talk about how writing blogs that you can get shared on things like Forbes or HuffPost can drive traffic to your website and can boost your business. So there's a, a profit motive for these kinds of guest bloggers. 
Um, on the other hand, we have professional journalism. Now there's pro profit motive for professional journalists. Journalists get paid for what they do. They want to write books that become bestsellers. They want to you know, win Pulitzer Prizes and things like that. But um, the idea of professional journalism is, is that it is supposed to be unbiased production and distribution of reports on current or past events based on facts and supported with evidence. Those are the two key factors of what professional journalism is supposed to rely on, facts and evidence. Um, journalism can apply to, this is the definition from Wikipedia, and they say journalism can apply to citizen journalists as well as professional ones, and that it can, journalism happens in all kinds of media, print, television, internet, whatever. Um, but the key words here, unbiased, based on facts, supported by evidence. How do journalists help ensure that that happens? Journalists and professional journalism organizations have code of ethic, codes of ethics that they follow. Um, now, there are no legal codes of ethics. It's not like um, a lawyer who belongs to a bar association who can lose his license if he violates their codes of ethics. Journalists don't have um, that kind of legal backup behind their, their codes of ethics. So that's problematic, but at the same time, they do have statements, they have company policies, um, that, that require them to uphold the standards of journalism, of truth supported by evidence. Um, so most of these different codes address things like truth, accuracy, objectivity, impartiality, fairness, public accountability, which is a big one, and conflicts of interest. So I was reading an article by, um, an author, by a journalist in the New York Times, and he mentioned the company BuzzFeed and then immediately said, but I can't write about BuzzFeed because I have not yet divested of my BuzzFeed stock. New York Times has a very strict policy that as a journalist, if you own stock in a company, you are not allowed to write about it in the New York Times. Um, so those are the kinds of things that are addressed by journalistic codes of ethics. Um, credible journalism organizations will have those codes posted on their websites. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the page and you click the about me section, usually you will find them there. And so yesterday or the day before I looked them up and I was able to quickly find the codes of ethics from, for example, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Christian Science Monitor, National Public Radio, AP News and Reuters. I was not able to find publicly published codes of ethics or standards on Fox News or MSNBC. If anyone can prove me wrong, I'd love to hear it but um, they, they made it very difficult to find anything related to codes of ethics or standards for their employees and their journalists. Um, you, so how do you find these codes of ethics? You scroll down to the bottom of the page, you click on the About Me page, um, you Google it. Sometimes it's hidden on their website and Google is the quickest way to turn it up. Um, but you should be able to find it. It shouldn't be that hard to find it with a professional journalism organization. So that's not to say that just because an organization has a code of ethics, it has no bias. Many good professional journalist, journalism sources have bias, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Many people find this chart, this is a media bias chart, helpful. There are some problems, but they, this, this organization, Ad Fontes Media, is very good about explaining their methodology and the data that they use to make these determinations. It's not just a, hey, I think this guy's liberal and that guy's conservative. They actually try to, to use some repeatable measures of where the um, bias lies for each of these organizations. I put a link to this website on the slide and I am gonna be sharing these slides with you later too. So, um, <clears throat> so this is just another example of how, um, you know, even what we would consider Professional journalism has bias. So you can see, for example, the Wall Street Journal on this chart is, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but it's kind of in the middle, but slightly leaning towards the right. Um, the public, the PBS Public Broadcast Service is pretty much in the middle, maybe just a smidgen to the right, to the left, excuse me. Um, you get over to MSNBC, it's sort of down in the middle of the chart for reliability and over in the hyperpartisan left category on the um, bias scale here. And conversely, um, Fox News, low on the lower or mid-range on the reliability scale, skews right to hyperpartisan right on the bias chart. So this is just a snapshot that can let you know, um, you know, the general leanings towards the news sources that you read. 
Is every story on each of these sources going to be biased in one direction or another? No, um, many times not. So this organization tries to look at an average of different stories at different points in the year to determine what the tendencies of that organization are. So this is a tool that is not a final answer to anything. Um, and we'll talk more in week two and week three about finding reliable resources for news. So this isn't it on this topic, but I just wanted to get this out there because it's something that people find interesting if they're not familiar with it already. And then just for the end of this presentation today, um, publishing versus self-publishing. So there are big differences between traditional publishing models and self-publishing ones. <clears throat> I am not a person that believes that self-publishing is wholly a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. It gives uh, a platform and opportunity for people who would not be able to make their voices heard in other ways. Um, the biggest difference is the business model of the two different types of publishing. And this is true um, sort of for online sources as well as offline print sources. So, but mostly I'm focusing on print here. I'm talking about a, an author who self-publishes a book versus an author who gets a publishing contract with HarperCollins or something like that. Um, <clears throat> traditional publishing is big business and it has the associated business interests, particularly profit, but also not getting sued. Um, so again, there are codes of ethics for book publishers and textbook publishers and other forms of publishing. Self-publishers don't typically follow those. That's not always true because the Independent Booksellers Association has published a code of ethics that they hope that their members will follow, but they have no teeth behind that. They, they literally just say, we hope you'll follow this. Um, in the traditional publishing model, talking about books here, generally speaking, what happens is that you write something and you get accepted by an agent. And then your agent shops that work out to editors at different publishing houses, and then you get accepted by one. And then your work goes through an editorial process. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you have people who are reading it for, um, you know, legal issues, potential legal issues, as well as the actual readable content of the book. And then you go through copy editing, um, design, and then finally the physical printing comes out. So again, mainstream publishers are big businesses and they have financial interests in ensuring that the things that they publish aren't plagiarism, aren't slander, aren't excessively filled with false information. So um, when you have a self-published book, and I'm gonna pick on a particular political figure here, but um, Donald Trump Jr. has written a book and he self-published it and he's selling lots of copies of it, but it did not go through a traditional printing house or publishing house. So it did not go through that process of editorial selection or editorial review. He could write anything he wanted in his book. And that's good for some reasons and not great for other reasons. Um, there's a strong case to be made that self-publishing would help change societal norms or change um, thinking about something because traditional publishers tend to be very conservative in, in you know, what they want to publish and what they don't. But at the same time, that fact checking thing and that review process is kind of important. Um, so self-publishing, again, it's less structured than traditional publishing. It's not entirely without structure though because most people who are self-publishing aren't like physically printing their books themselves. They're running them through a service to print and bind the books. And so some of those services do have standards that can help um, that do, do address issues like plagiarism or um, copyright or things like that. But they're not generally self-publishing companies gonna worry about fact. Um, they're not going to worry about quality. They're just going to worry about, you know, are we printing something that is wholesale plagiarized from another person? Okay, so next week we're going to talk about why some of these things happen. We'll talk a little bit more about the psychology behind fake news and conspiracy theories. Um, so just to recap today, we talked about the differences between misinformation and disinformation. Um, we looked at examples of both of those, as well as fake news and satire and scams. We looked at a few of the consequences of misinformation and disinformation. And then we talked briefly about the differences between professional journalism and citizen journalism and professional and self-publishing. Um, so next week, we're gonna, I do have some readings that I assigned. Again, I wanna emphasize that you're not absolutely required. If you don't get through all the readings, please do come to class anyway. We wanna hear from you. We wanna um, talk with you. <clears throat> Some of the readings I put in there um, have to do with the psychology behind fake news and conspiracy theories. 
Um, and then next week, we're going to also talk about other ways that your online newsfeed in particular gets distorted, including with bots and troll farms and filter bubbles and other kinds of fake news. Um, when we talk about psychology next week, please know I have no formal training in psychology. I'm not a psychologist. So that's why I'm sharing these readings with you and we're just going to have a discussion about it. I'm not trying to um, you know, mislead you to make you think that I'm a, a psychology professional here. So thank you. I'm sorry for running over a little bit, but I think I did okay in terms of time, um, considering how much information I wanted to share. But I want to open it back up and ask if anyone has any questions or comments that they want to share right now. Thank you, Teresa. Wonderful. Yep, very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Really good. Thank you. Thank Enjoyed you. It Thank so you. Far. Nice job. Okay, so I will just tell you on the FE University website, if you go to feuniversity.org and then you click on course materials, you'll see a link to my class. I've put up some readings for, to prepare for week two. I also put up a couple of suggestions that you might be interested in for week one. I just want to mention one of them, and I know at least one of you has already watched this. There's a new documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, and it's kind of interesting. It, it features a lot of interviews with um, figures who played important roles in the creation of some of these social media tools. I, I recommend it with hesitation because the documentary is also dramatized and it feels a little funny that all these people are talking about how social media has developed this, you know, has used specific psychological tools to manipulate your thinking, but the documentary at the same time is using dramatic music and a fictionalized story to propel their narrative in ways that sort of play on those same psychological tools. So I will say, take it with a grain of salt. If you have time to watch it, I think it's worth watching. It's about an hour and a half. If you don't have a Netflix account, you can sign up for a free 30 day trial. So um, give that a shot or, or borrow a friend's Netflix login. I didn't say that out loud. Um, but again, don't, it, it, is, it, is, it is motivated to scare you. Um, so go into it with like a tablespoon of salt more than just a grain. But I think it's still worth a watch if you wanna take the time. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you, everybody. All right, thanks, thank everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.